I'd like to now look at the draft documents that have been approved unanimously by the board and recommended to the congregation and review some of the principal uh, aspects of those documents. The proposed Constitution has a preamble. The preamble uh, states that the purpose of the Constitution is to provide structure and a means of governance of the mission and the ministry of Central Christian Church. The draft also, unlike the current uh, Constitution, uh, provides for a purpose statement and uh, said simply the purpose statement invokes scripture. Uh, it calls for the purpose of our church to be a ministry that puts into action the mandates of Christ uh, to his people. Uh, principal changes that uh, are reflected in the draft, uh, first of all, focus upon church officers. Uh, church officers, uh, of course, include the elders, the deacons, and the trustees. Uh, they are elected and they are called to service on the board and otherwise, of course, in the case of the elders. We have in the new draft constitution uh, reduced the number of elders and deacons that serve on the board. And the thinking behind this is that as a uh, body becomes larger, uh, it's a temptation for everyone to perhaps feel a little less responsibility for, for being present and being an active member of that body. So the current constitution provides that the board will have 24 elders, but we have in the draft reduced that number to 12. With deacons, and by the way, we will only under this uh, document have deacons. We do not have any type of gender distinctions between deacons and deaconesses. The number of deacons will be 36 as opposed to the current 48. And then trustees uh, will number four as opposed to the current six. And I do want to note with trustees, under the uh, proposed constitution, they are regarded as church officers and not regarded as board officers. Uh, in the past, uh, the constitution has designated them as board officers, but they have not acted in that capacity, uh, as would, of course, the chair of the board, the vice chair, the secretary, and the treasurer. Uh, the importance of uh, that change is to, of course, uh, clarify uh, actual practice, but also with the trustees in the uh, proposed document, uh, we have uh, cleaned up language to make it clear that this is a board-centered church, uh, that decisions are made by the board, and uh, very important, uh, the current constitution allows some uh, possibility of the trustees acting without the approval of the board, uh, the current language is at least ambiguous. Uh, this proposed constitution cleans that up and it makes it clear that the board is the sole governing authority of the church, of course, operating under the auspices of the congregation, needless to say, and that uh, any type of action that would be taken by the trustees would have to be pursuant to authorization and uh, board resolution. The Office of Clerk uh, has been uh, deleted from the new Constitution in that those uh, uh, responsibilities previously in an earlier age uh, done by the clerk are now all handled by the church office and our, and our fine staff. The board officers uh, currently uh, serve a three-year term. The practice, in fact, has been for board officers to serve one a year. Uh, we have uh, adjusted the term length to provide for a one-year term with the possibility of election to a second year. And likewise with the elders and deacons and trustees that are serving on the board, uh, we have reduced the period of service from the current three years to two years. The reason that we have made that uh, suggested reduction is that uh, a three-year commitment is regarded by most folks as, as a lengthy commitment. Uh, a one-year uh, commitment uh, to serve on the board perhaps does not give an uh, elder or a deacon as a board member the opportunity to really get fully into the flow before their term expires. And it's our judgment and it's been of course uh, also endorsed by the board that uh, a two-year term seems to be appropriate. The draft constitution provides for a, an election process for board officers and also, of course, for church officers. Uh, we believe that we have cleaned up and, and streamlined these processes so that they will be better understood uh, by all who are involved. 
uh, as those processes of election unfold in the latter months of the year. We have also provided that the elders, the deacons, and the trustees should, prior to the beginning of the church year, the fiscal year as well, in January, should elect a chair from among their number. Uh, currently, uh, although we have had a chair of the elders, it has been an informal process, and the, with the deacons and the trustees, we have not had a mechanism whereby a chair could be designated. It's important that each of those groups in and of themselves have someone to lead them, and hence we have provided for a chair position of the elders, deacons, and the trustees in the draft constitution. The Pastoral Relations Committee, of course, is an important group within the church, uh, serving uh, as a liaison between the congregation and our ministerial staff. Uh, the uh, aspects of that committee uh, are largely untouched in the draft constitution. However, they have been engrafted into the Constitution because we regard them as a very important and uh, best placed within the context of the Constitution as the governing document of the Church. An important change involves the Cabinet. Uh, the new draft Constitution uh, does not provide for a Cabinet, but uh, it's very important to recognize that uh, another uh, structure of leadership of the various mission and ministry activities of the church has been provided. Uh, specifically, we have provided for an executive work group. Uh, this allows the senior minister, the chair, the board officers to essentially call together those persons who are necessary to address a specific matter or issue or challenge uh, that is facing uh, the church that we want to advance. The, the current cabinet uh, has provided, of course, for a group to come together, but oftentimes uh, we have found that uh, people are called to cabinet meetings when the agenda items that are under consideration really do not fall within their bailiwick of uh, activity within our congregation and ministry. So the executive work group is essentially a, a vehicle that gives to the senior minister, it gives to the chair, the board officers, the ability to, to call together those who are best positioned to address, to discuss, and to uh, make uh, recommendations regarding the direction of a ministry aspect of Central. The other changes in the Constitution and bylaws that uh, are important uh, are the creation of what are called ministry teams. Uh, this is really a relabeling in the sense of what we now refer to as departments. Uh, ministry teams, uh, of course, uh, are the teams that are, so to say, on the ground, boots on the ground, making things happen uh, within our ministry. The, the bylaws has retained the uh, functions of the various departments. Uh, there has been a little bit of uh, rearrangement uh, between uh, departments as they have been renamed and reallocated to the ministry teams, but essentially uh, this is a change in nomenclature uh, that uh, reflects the, the fact that we are involved in ministry uh, and this is not uh, merely a, an office operation with departments. The bylaws state briefly the purpose of each of the ministry teams. Uh, currently, however, in the existing bylaws, the responsibilities, the duties, the obligations of the various departments are stated at some length. Uh, the problem that has arisen is that uh, the uh, responsibilities of various departments can shift, can change, can evolve over a period of time. In order to handle that uh, reality, the current bylaws state uh, the purpose of the ministry team. However, there will then be sub-documents, not part of the Constitution, and not part of the bylaws, that essentially are position descriptions uh, that will be provided to the ministry team leaders that will be obviously amended from time to time, but that will reflect the current needs of the church and our ministry in regard to the particular ministry team. The bylaws also uh, create a, a mechanism within the existing personnel committee uh, such that if uh, there, are, uh, th there arises uh, friction between, uh, for instance, two staff members, that the, there is a means for each of the uh, parties involved to be heard. But uh, in order to create a comfort level or a safe zone in which uh, concerns may be heard, 
uh, by the personnel committee. There's also a provision that provides for self-recusal of a person, uh, in essence stepping outside the room when uh, your concern or matter uh, regarding personnel is being discussed. And also, although we don't anticipate it would be used, uh, we have a provision also for mandatory a recusal of a person who is involved in the matter. And this is to create a comfort zone so that uh, any type of uh, differences or concerns uh, of the staff and the like can be heard in an environment uh, which is free and open. And of course, the input of everybody uh, would be welcomed in those instances. The uh, bylaws, uh, we believe, have provided for a uh, updated uh, description of what we're actually doing in our church and in our, our ministry involvements currently, but uh, as with the Constitution, we believe that uh, the bylaws, when read, will reflect a much more uh, dynamic uh, sense of ministry that we have here at Central Christian. And uh, as noted uh, before, in regard to both process and substance, this has been a matter which has been very prayerfully considered and uh, we are very pleased that uh, so many have been a part of this process. We feel it's been very transparent and uh, open to the input of all of the members of our congregation and we're especially appreciative of the unanimous vote that was taken by the board in late August to recommend these bylaws as well as the Constitution uh, to the church and to our uh, congregation assembled this morning. Thank you.